Hello, this is Naomi with Sword and Steel, and today I have this silver bayonet book given to me by Osprey Games, and Joseph McCullough is the author, and they wanted me to check it out and show it off to you, and I knew I was going to like it because it was by Joseph A. McCullough, and he did Stargrave, and that sounded fantastic. Um, and of course, because it's a war game of Napoleonic gothic horror and uh yeah i'm down with that okay so what this is all about is do, 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 is playing a miniature game um in britain in the napoleonic time period so think it's easiest to think about the time period based on uh, the guns for anyone who's unfamiliar with the Napoleonic period. Okay, so da, 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 let's go just scoot to the guns to give you an idea. We've got uh, muskets, pistols, rifles, volley guns, blunderbusses, breastplates, cartridge, botri cartridge bo boxes, um, oil and torches, <laughs> silver shots, silver weapons, cold iron weapons, iron, holy symbols, and whatnot. You see this guy? And there's beautiful, just as they did in other books, um, there's some fantastic uh, artistry involved in here to get you into the mood for it. All in black and white, because this would have been a black and white time, of course. This time period. But with horror. Um, let me just give you some idea of the concept specifically. Okay, I'm gonna read the background because you have to you have to understand the background to know whether you want to play it. And uh, I read the background and realized that it would be fantastic. And now I am on the search for miniatures that would work with this. Actually, before I forget, uh, the silver bayonet for a limited time from the looks of it um, can be purchased with miniatures by do, 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 North Star Military Figures on it's either the Osprey Games website or the North Star Figures website, but you can get the book and the figures that they made for the book with it. Uh, now, they're metal figurines, so I'm going to personally wait until I see some plastic ones or some higher quality, larger scale ones. Um, but hey, that just gives me more time to create a background behind it. Okay, so let's read the background. Europe is aflame. <laughs> I don't know whether I should keep these in, but these are so fun. Okay, because yeah, I don't know if you're going to understand me. Europe is aflame. The revolutionary armies of Napoleon Bonaparte tear their way through the heart of Europe, leaving death and destruction in their wake. And yet a few learned scholars have identified an even greater threat to the order. The first clues were the sky battles, strange echoes of warfare sometimes heard after particularly bloody confrontations. But those passed without a trace. And seeking the truth behind the sky battles, curious scholars consulted with occultist seers and religious mystics. So it was learned of the harvestmen, spirits or demons that feed off the pain, fear and rage of mortal men and women. And that the sky battles were echoes of their gluttonous feasts. To the harvestmen, the horrors of the Napoleonic Wars are a bounty like no other. They gorge themselves on the suffering, then use that power to bring forth the twisted nightmares of Europe's myths and legends, perpetuating the cycle of pain and fear. Vampires, werewolves, ghosts, and ghouls have all been summoned by the power of the harvestmen. And they have taken advantage of the chaos of war to strike at isolated farms, villages, and even military units. In some places, the harvestmen have used their power to tear holes into the fairy realms, releasing goblins, trolls, and worse. If these creatures are allowed to run rampant, their depredations could ultimately create more suffering, suffering than even the wars of Bonaparte himself. For the present, most people dismiss the existence of the harvestmen and their servants as delusional rantings. However, a learned few 
recognize the very danger, the very real danger the harvestmen present. In Britain, a secret award is given to the soldiers who have faced and defeated these otherworldly evils. The silver bayonet, you know where we're coming in now, right? These soldiers are often inducted into small specialist units led by a veteran exploring officer. These, so, um, the, these silver bayonet units search for secret knowledge and weapons uh, that can be used against the forces of the Harvestmen and fight to eliminate these evils wherever they are found. The other great powers, France, Russia, Spain, Austria, and Prussia, all have their own units dedicated to the cause. You can choose which one you want. And of course, if you were going to be facing off against someone, then you presumably would choose two different un uh, nations who are fighting for the same uh, rewards, I guess. Occasionally, these units work together to face some great menace, but more often than not, they battle with one another, hoping to secure some ancient knowledge or lost treasure that will give them their homeland, that will give their homeland the upper hand in the war that is fought in the shadows. And it is so much fun. So it goes into um, how it's a war game, but uh, it's a war game basically between two people uh, who have small war bands. Uh, introducing the uh, concept of an officer and two, and maybe based on the points costs of um, of each of the models, probably five to eight other models beyond the officer, and you can play it competitively, uh, where you're on the battlefield facing off um, against each other as well as getting a primary objective of some kind, um, and the primary objectives are quite important of uh, taking down your enemy's units get you some experience points but only to a maximum of two experience points to killing three of the war their uh, their models so that is not the primary objective of course you can also there's also rules in the back towards playing by yourself as a solo campaign or playing cooperatively so that you're working together if you have one special unit basically uh, and two special officers to play there, it has been really well written, and you don't need to have wargaming experience to understand the concepts of um, what they're talking about in here, because it's written in very clear language. However, if you are familiar, of course, you'll learn how to play so much the faster. It goes over what you need to play, miniatures, the table, and terrain, and of course, they have each scenario is laid out for what you sort of need to bring to the table to play for each scenario. One of the scenarios is, for example, a troll under the bridge, so you need a troll model, hopefully, um, and you need a bridge and a river, uh, but how you do it and what scale it is is all based on what you want as long as it's in the same scale. They even spec specify that though all of the, uh, the uh, all of the stats are based on inches for movement, it would be easy enough to use two centimeters for one inch in here or any other thing. I mean, a foot if you wanted to play it LARPing, um, whichever you wanted. As long as you stuck to the one system of measurement, it works. And you need some tokens and markers, and the dice are used uh, d10s, and you originally want to have three different colors of d10s, uh, because you're rolling multiple uh, d10s at the same time to represent different things, like power dice, and skill dice, and monster dice. So three different d10s, but you don't need very many, maybe maximum three to five. Oh wait, I think it says right here now. Um, although all of the dice used in the game are 10-sided, there are three distinct types of dice that should be designated by colour. Skill dice, red, power dice, blue, and monster dice, black. But of course, whichever colour that you want, really. At a minimum, each player will want one skill dice and one power dice. As most rolls in the game call, f call for rolling one of each and adding the result together. That said, most, probably, most players will probably want a small handful of each colour available, as this will make it easier to keep tracks of things during the game. All of this will be explained later in the rules, and they, are, they do have a little pool that improves your abilities, uh, called a fate pool, uh, where you are going to... That's what I say about three of each, because you're going to probably be using 
three of each in a particular game per person. And then you have a deck of cards, which is cute. Um, the the random monster determination or event termination, but mostly monster determination is through decks of cards. I'm just gonna, uh, which is quite cute. Like um, I grabbed the scenario number one, which is what they suggest you try out before you try out any of the other scenarios, because it's simple, straightforward, gets you started learning how to play. As for example, an ace of diamonds. Um, is a hobgoblin. A king of diamonds is strange footprints. A queen of diamonds is strange claw marks. So you, generally speaking, are going towards these clues because you're investigating everything and trying to understand what is going on. You go towards these clues and you have your little deck of cards to uh, determine what it is that the clue represents when you reach it on the battlefield. Uh, now, back to where it was. Uh, you have a unit sheet, which is just, you know, the, your character sheet to make certain you keep all of their stats organized. And there is a copy of what that should look like. You can either write it on a piece of paper or just copy this, your unit sheet, in the back. A pencil, because they would just want you to, you think you should write your unit sheet out. Me, mm -hmm. I would probably, uh, I'd probably take a picture of it and have my unit sheet on my, on my phone, just so I could just use it over and over again. But they say use a pencil. They think it's just easiest, fastest to attribute um, health and stuff like that. Kind of Dungeons and Dragons style. Um, but uh, even your health, they. Uh, uh, the author suggested that you use, you uh, note down your health points having changed um, on your unit sheet. I think I'd just use tokens on the battlefield for that and then note it after if it sticks. Uh, you can play uh, each of the scenarios singly as a one-time sort of thing, but of course it encourages campaign use, which would be so much more fun, I imagine, because the style definitely seems like it would be great for a campaign. Okay. Uh, and a measuring device, which would be in inches, something that measures inches, uh, or anything else. As I said, measuring the, the units don't particularly matter. Now, to create unit, you choose a nation. Nations will, uh, will guide you to who you can choose. However, you have the option to choose someone, f one of your characters can be from one of the other nations. So, for me, I would choose Britain, because I'm in Britain. No, I just like Britain. Um, but I might, might choose a character from Russia because there's a werebear in Russia and that sounds like a lot of fun. But he's a lot of cost, so maybe not. I might, or France has a specific model with like a female spy. Um, I might choose her too. So you, the first off, you choose a nation and it, it has all of these little in pink notes are just uh, little footnotes to make it easier for you to play the game. Uh, which is really nice. Someone really put a lot of thought in this. Well, Joseph. Joseph really put a lot of thought in this and it's uh, it's really easy to read through. You do have to read through basically all of the rules and creating everything before you can play. There's no starting point. You don't want to just scoop to the scenario and, and give it a go. You want to read through it, but it's really easy to read through and I find it interesting anyway. Oh, shoot. Um, every unit is led by an officer, so here are the starting officer's stats, and as you can see, you have a recruitment cost of one, which 100, which means that um, the soldiers that will come with them all have a specific cost. Do, 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 once we get past the create your soldiers, soldiers so, right? So like the grenadier, which it has is from any nationality, is a recruitment cost of 15. Um, and you have 100 points to go with. Now, when you've chosen your officer, uh, you can increase or decrease a couple of their stats depending. Um, yeah, increasing stats. So to determine your officer's starting stats, these are the baseline stats of speed six and inches, uh, plus one to one, plus one melee, plus one accuracy, defense of 14, plus two to courage, plus uh, 12 health, 
and 100 recruitment. And so these, if you're at all familiar with modifiers, when you're rolling your dice, you add one if it has a melee of plus one. When you're rolling your dice for accuracy check, uh, they're all called checks. So a melee check, if you're choosing an accuracy check, you add one to the roll. Uh, you have a defense of 14. When someone's attacking you, they're trying to get above equal to or above 14 to do any damage to you. Uh, courage, as you would expect, you have to sometimes take terror checks depending on the situation and you get this officer gets plus two to the roll and then your health is 12. I enjoy the fact that the attacks and the hits are all in the same roll which is interesting. Um, when you're shooting or attacking you're going to be rolling two d10s and one of them is your power and one of them is your skill dice. And depending on the weapon that you're using, you either choose the power or the skill as your damage. So as you're rolling to see if you hit, adding up the numbers between them, you're also rolling the damage. Speeds, speeds things up. I like that. Um, and it goes through more, uh, for those who aren't familiar with what these particular stats matter, uh, mean it goes through them in a little bit more detail. Uh, and then it talks about how the recruitment status for buying your soldiers. Right, so determine your officer's starting stats. Take the starting officer stat line and then do each of the following. Increase either melee or accuracy by one, increase speed or health by one, increase courage by plus one, or recruitment by five. So you could have 105. And it just, that just allows you to have a very um, individualized officer like that fellow. I've already figured out my officer. His name is James Crawford. I don't know if I got that from anywhere. It just came to me. So if he's something, I guess I stole it. But his name is James Crawford. He's a bit stiff, young, trying to figure things out, um, but is very smart and knows when to take the advice of people who are more knowledgeable than him. So of course, in his group, he's got people who are knowledgeable. Um, the attributes. Attributes is a broad, broad term that covers skills. Okay, so equipment. The last step to creating an officer is choosing their equipment. This includes all of their weapons, armor, and other gear, as well as any special items they might be carrying to help battle supernatural forces. Officers have six equipment slots, two of which can be the special armory, which is just over here, four of which are general armory. Um, the bigger weapons take up two slots, and you generally need a cartridge box or some sort of ammunition to take up a slot as well so that you can actually fire your, your uh, weapon. A musket, a rifle, a pistol, a volley gun. Um, cold iron shot, cold iron weapon, so this is a special armory. Oil and torches, salt bags, silver shot, do not underestimate the power of some of these special armor uh, equipment items like oil and torches, for example. Sometimes the best weapon against a monster is good old-fashioned fire. A figure with oil and torches may spend an action to light a torch. While a figure is carrying a torch, it counts as being armed with an improvised weapon and may not use any weapon that, may, that takes up two or more equipment slots. So no rifles when you're holding a torch. Can't one-hand your rifle. Many creatures that are immune to normal weapons, such as vampires and werewolves, can be hurt by fire. Oil and torches take a one equipment slot. Very straightforward to uh, equipping your fellow. Very straightforward. And once you have your officer figured out, you select your soldiers. It tells you right here what the various um, nations can bring along with them. Uh, Austria, Britain, France, Persia, Russia, and Spain. Uh, do, 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 optional rule going outside the list that's what I would be using to bring in my uh, Russian werebear or my France my French vivandaire because that sounded cool too I read through each of these they each give you a rough idea of what you can do with them it really depends on the scenario that you're in um, artillerist champion of faith and they each have their specific things some of them are very basic and some of them have very specific uh, extra abilities like uh, a damp a damp fear um, has a damage reduction of one strong and indefatigable people get tired when they're fighting 
Um, so having an indefatigable fellow uh, might actually serve very well because once you have two fatigue tokens, you can't do anything and have to rest or something like that. Um, but it's relevant to the game. Guard, grenade, uh, guard, grenadier, a heavy cavalryman, highlander, infantryman, irregulars, as you can see, it's in athletic order, so you can easily find the one that you're looking for. Occultist, sailor. Uh, actually, I think one of the scenarios is on a ship, so you might, might, might find that useful. A sapper, oh, and they also can climb. A sailor can climb as well. You never know. You never know who's going to be useful. A supernatural investigator. That's the one I would be taking. A swordsman, a tactician, and a veteran hunter. With all these lovely things. Vivendier, wear, bear. Uh, and once you've chosen your unit, you start playing the game. You set up the table, you set up clue markers. Most scenarios include two or more clue markers. These are small markers that designate points of interest on the table. What exactly clue markers represent will vary from each scenario to scenario. For example, in one scenario, the units may be looking for a tome of magic, and, of, and each of the clue markers represents a book. Players won't know if it is a specific book they are looking for until they investigate, which is an action, uh, look that clue. In another scenario, the units might be trying to find a secret entrance to an underground vault, and each of the clue markers represents a potential spot where the door could be located. Now, each scenario will include a clue marker table that I showed you previously with Ace of Diamonds, King of Diamonds, that, that sort of thing, to see what it is that you find after you reach and investigate the clue on the battlefield. And again, checks is how you determine whether you succeed or not so if you get above if you get equal to or above the check uh you succeed if you uh, fail it's because you got less than the check number and what happens if you fail is dependent on the scenario and what you're trying the turn is very straightforward it's a turn-based game each person gets to have choose one character and uh oh well, i should read it out to you actually uh, but it's very straightforward uh, there starts with the initiative phase where you determine who uh, gets to go first. Unless you're in an ambush, which I believe means that the monsters get to go first, which is always fun. Uh, the primary player phase, during this phase, the primary player must activate half the members of their unit that are on the table, rounded down with a minimum of one. So if the primary player has seven figures on the table, they must activate three. If they have one, they must activate one. There are no other limitations on which figures in the unit may be activated, and they may be activated in any order the player chooses. And then we've got the monster phases. During all the phases, all the monsters on the table activate and take actions. This is explained fully in the monster action. So monsters are Basically, one person gets to it, use the monster for one turn, and the other person gets to use the monster for the other turn and go back and forth. If I'm remembering correctly, it's written on page 73. Let's double check. I might as well be accurate to it. Do, 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 do. During the monster phase, uh, every monster will activate, going in order from the monster with the lowest current health to the highest. In cases where there are multiple monsters with the same health, the primary player for the turn may decide the order in which they activate. What exactly a monster does when it activates depends on the monster in question and the scenario being played. This will be listed either in the special rules for the scenario or in the monster's entry in the bestiary. If no special instructions are given, then the monster follows the standard as rule for monster activation given below. And so number one, does the monster have an unloaded projectile weapon? That's right. Monsters have projectile weapons, isn't that great? Uh, yes, then you reload it. Now, reloading is an action. Because these are slower weapons, you must reload sometimes. Uh, having multiple weapons so that you aren't necessarily just firing, reload, firing, reload, firing, and reload when you're in a very dire situation would be handy, I think. Uh, two, does the mon- oh, right. Uh, yes, reload the weapon. Two, no, proceed to question two. Does the monster have a loaded projectile weapon and a soldier in range and line of sight? Isn't that scary? Just, uh, you know, monsters shooting, shooting people. Yes, it makes a shooting attack. No, go to turn three. Is there a soldier within line of sight of a monster? Yes, the monster runs toward him. Isn't that nice and scary? No, 
the monster doesn't. He just moves towards the closest soldier. Oh, so nasty. Um, right. Uh, then it's the secondary player's phase who gets to do everything, and then the primary player's phase gets to do the rest of his people for competitive play. Oh, and there's a special, there's a specialty I nearly forgot. There's a specialty if you get a crit, basically, which is on two d10, um, a two tens, and a fumble, which is two ones. If you get a crit, then you get an additional dice into your fate pool, which again um, allows you to basically do better, uh, re-roll things, give yourself more action, stuff like that. Give monsters more action, stuff like that. Um, that's what the fate pool is for. And you get to roll on the unexpected event table, shall we? The unexpected events table, I just love twists, um, is one, rain. It started to rain heavily. All shooting attacks offer a minus two penalty. Now, this is, it isn't necessarily going to happen because you have to roll. This is the unexpected events. Yeah, this is for if you roll two tens followed by a one. So not really going to happen very often, but it started to rain heavily. And if you were all about shooting, you just now have a minus two penalty. Two, fog. The maximum line of sight from the scenario is reduced to 10 inches. Three, wall of terror. Every soldier on the table must make an immediate terror check uh, at mm, equaling to zero. And the terror checks are further uh, further ahead. I think, did I memorize it? Feels like it was 67. I don't know why. I... Let's do two. See if I actually memorize that correctly. Oh my gosh, I did. Wow. Thought it was important, so I memorized it. So there's a terror check. You either collapse, not so good, uh, you're paralyzed, you're shaken, you're stunned, you're distracted, or an 11 plus, you're just fine. And that's right, so you make a terror check. That could really dent, make a dent in things. There's a deluge. It starts raining so hard that all firearms are rendered useless. Might want to have a melee weapon. On the other hand, you can have an improvised weapon, so it's not all bad, and it's very not unlikely it would happen. Any other shooting tax are at F. negative four. Every figure suffers a minus one to speed. Uh, five, artillery strike, just for funsies. Let's just throw some artillery in there. Six, the wheel of fate turns. For the rest of the turn, neither player may use any power dice or skill dice from their fate pool. Were you relying on those fate pool dice? Well, too bad. They may, but they may use monster dice as normal. The monsters are fine, though. A seven, strength of the faithful. Eight, powerful enchantment. Nine, mysterious movement. Each player should pick two members of the opposing unit and switch the place of those two figures. That sounds fun. And ten, lucky find. Both players should choose one figure. This figure is immediately granted one item from the special armory list that they can use for the rest of the scenario. That's neat. So super fun. And then... <laughs> If, however, you rolled a fumble, <laughs> any time a player rolls a double one for their initiative check, they should immediately roll two dice and compare the result to the table below. This creature should then be placed in the center of a randomly determined table edge. Some players really love using unexpected encounters. I do. Uh, if that is true for your group, feel free to increase this frequency. For example, to any time a player rolls four or less on an initiative check. You really want to put a dent in everyone's day? Just great, Brad, bring in a random demon. A, well, black dog doesn't sound that bad. A bandit. A dark wolf. A changeling. Living armor. Ooh, that sounds hard to fight against. Pixie, ghost, werewolf, vampire. What am I? What am I today? I think I'm a goblin. All right. Activation. Oh, and it has, uh, again, I said in these little pink boxes, it has nice, nice little um, additions uh, where it doesn't matter what your model is facing, it counts as being facing in all directions. But if you really wanted to, you could turn it around um, for aesthetic purposes so that you're not trying to fight someone behind you by looking behind you. Movement. 
obstructions. The, the terrain system is quite straightforward, basically. If you're going up a terrain or going through difficult terrain, um, you just have to double the movement that you would need to get up it. So a two inch wall counts as four inches of your movement. Going through mud and other difficult ground counts as move one inch, counts as two, that sort of thing. You can move off the table, of course you can't come back, but he, he noted it in there. You move to attack, uh, you forced attack, which is interesting, not exactly certain when this would happen, but basically if you move to be within one inch of your enemy and you weren't moving to attack, they can cause you to attack by going the rest of the way towards you, forcing you to make the attack against them. So bear that in mind, that's the interesting thing. You can jump. If you jump from somewhere that's too tall, it's no longer jumping, it's falling and you take damage. It's all very easy to figure out. Uh, nothing counterintuitive that I found. You investigate your clue markers, you load and reload, smoke. Since reloading and reloading is a big part of the game, uh, unless you are really strange and didn't take any weapons that you shoot with, Reloading and loading is a big part of the game, and the, he suggests to add little bits of uh, doo -doo -doo -doo, uh, a small ball of cotton wool in front of a figure that has fired his weapon to designate the fact that he needs to reload it uh, before he goes ahead and tries to fire it again. Uh, melee combat, it's all quite straightforward. Um, as I said, all of your guys do stuff. Uh, you activate the player, the first player activates half of his guys, but in melee combat, you fight each other, and in shooting combat, you fight each other. So, even though it sounds initially like um, someone is going to be able to do half of everything first, it's not really that way uh, because they always have the option to fight back in the turn that you, even as the person is activating. For example, the person in melee combat, they go into attack, they make their attack, the other person can either strike back or back off. Striking back is just the exact same thing that you did to attack them. It's just called striking back. Now, fatigue and distraction. If a figure is involved in multiple melee attacks in the same turn, as either attacker or defender, it begins to tire. Uh, as soon as a melee attack ends, all figures are given a fatigue token. For each fatigue token a figure has, it suffers minus one to its defense and melee stats, so that it is both easier to hit and less likely to hit its opponent. It makes sense, I like that they added it. Remember though, fatigue tokens are only given at the end of a melee attack, after all other results have been determined, so that a figure that strikes back will do so before the fatigue token is gained. If the defender in a melee attack strikes back, the full encounter only gives one fatigue token, it only accounts. Uh, counts as one melee attack. If the closest enemy figure is within two inches, active figure may spend their action to give that enemy a fatigue token. And doing so ends the figure's activation immediately. This represents the figure is distracting their enemy, making it easier for its allies to strike. A figure may never have more than two fatigue tokens, no matter the source. All fatigue tokens are removed at the end of each turn. I do enjoy that style. It makes sense. And yes, it does add a bit of complexity, but I think it's nice complexity. And again, it's not counter to complexity. They're getting exhausted. This is real combat. And yeah, it's all it's all really straightforward, really well written. Um, if you wanted to play a, a role playing game and just use these stats, you'd find it really easy to follow. They've got he's got everything figured out. Shooting attack, of course, doesn't cause fatigue because it's shooting. So. Uh, you've got cover. It does pay attention to cover. And this kind of answers the cover right here for you. The soldier of the specialist unit are survivors and know the value of cover. For this reason, when trying to determine if a figure is in cover, the player should always err on the side of the defender. If a figure has even only a little scrap of cover, you can bet it will be using it when the musket balls are flying. It makes sense. If there is at all question, assume that he has cover. Makes sense. And uh, with respect to cover, here's the 
what gives you cover and what the modifier to your shooting roll is. Very straightforward. Um, everything is straightforward, well thought out. And you have the optional rule of critical hits and critical failures, which I very much like. Basically, if you critical hit, you do extra damage and get uh, blah, 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 blah. two effects first. The target takes an additional two points of damage on top of whatever they normally take. Additionally, if it, it was a melee attack, the target cannot strike back and must back off, which is quite nasty. Um, if it was a shooting attack, the target can neither return fire nor die for cover and makes no response to the attack, so it really knocked the other person out. On the flip side, if they make a uh, fumble uh, they have or a critical failure, the first result is that no dice from the fate you fate pool may be used to modify the rule. No, so you can't change it. Additionally, um, they might, they, if they're the figure is making a melee attack, they manage to lose the weapon. If they have no other weapon, treat them as having an improvised weapon for the rest of the scenario. If the figure was making a shooting attack, then something has gone wrong with their weapon. It is either jammed or is broken. It cannot be used to make shooting attacks for the rest of the scenario. I very much like that. That's how I would want to play because um, combat is hard. And I like it turning out that way. And I always enjoyed fumbles and crits in Duchess of Dragons. Uh, la, la, la. Calvary goes into Calvary, goes into the terror checks that I already went into. Um, everything is really straightforward. It goes into the fate pool, how you have two power dice, two skill dice, and two monster dice, and how you can affect your roll that way. Um, how you and this is how you either do a reroll, you negate some damage, only some damage. You have a quick reload, you have a monster dice. So uh, the quick reload does save you from having to wait a whole turn before you can activate with your character again. Whenever a figure activates, the player may spend either a skill die or a power die from the fate pool to have the figure reload their weapon without spending an action. So a figure could move, reload using a fate die, and then make a shooting attack all during the same activation. But of course you only have a couple of those dice in your fate pool per turn, so bear that in mind and that's for everyone. You only have a couple for all your guys. And then it goes back to the monster actions, we went into that. It chats about how you'd probably have a lot more fun using these models in a campaign rather than a one-off thing, I agree. And how it tells you how you can start a campaign. And uh, all again in very straightforward language and some experience and all that. It gives you 10 scenarios, it tells you at the end of each of the scenarios, and the scenarios are very straightforward. Um, with special rules that are easy to understand, rewards that are easy to divvy up. Confirmed kill. It has a little, uh, egg, a little blurb of what is going on. For example, scenario four: confirmed kill. An ambush in the in the forest is believed to have killed an infamous enemy agent. However, before the am ambushers could confirm the kill, they were chased off by a small gang of strange creatures. You have been tasked with venturing into the forest, finding the body of the enemy agent and recovering his signet ring to confirm his death. Set up, place five markers, running on an imaginary line through the center of the table, parallel to the player's starting edges. These clue markers should be equally placed along the length of the line. The table should be covered with trees, low underbrush, and maybe a stream. Once all of the clue markers are in place, each player should roll a die. The player who rolls highest should choose one side of the table and play, place all the members of their unit within two inches of that table edge. The other player should then place all the members of their unit within two inches of the opposite table edge. As you can see, we are searching for the same signet ring and trying to get to it first. And um, so the scenarios are all basically like that. Cute, lovely little things. Actually, come to think of it, uh, someone sent me a game that he, he suggests... He suggests moving from these ten scenarios um, and creating your own scenarios and he tells you exactly how to do so and come to think of it there was someone who sent me the cutest little game that was really just scenarios played out and they would match wonderfully into this basically a wizard um, gives uh, you a bunch of things that he'd like you to do and it, it would totally work in this scenario too so I already have more scenarios to keep playing with these characters which is great and now, so, solo play. How to do a solo play. 
how to create a specialist unit for solo play, how the turn is a bit adjusted for solo play, first straight forward, so he's got it all figured out, and how you can turn solo play into cooperative play, um, and what you have to do to create your specialist unit according to that, what happens with unexpected events and encounters, he's got it all figured out, creating your scenarios for solo play, and he has four scenarios to give you an idea of how you should do it. And then at the very end, we have the bestiary. So when you're faced off with all of those monsters uh, in the various scenarios, it has all the stats for it. Bandits, black dogs, changelings, cultists, dark wolves, hobgoblins, living armor, living scarecrows, pixies, possessed, revenants, trolls, vampires, vampire bats, werewolves, and cr of course creating your own monsters there's enough variety in what you just saw that you could absolutely create your own monster um mimicking some of the stats that are here uh, but he goes into it anyway to give you an even better idea of how to do it and some possible art attributes that the monsters could be having really well thought out oh and even spells um, and I very much enjoy this book and I am now on the search to create my warbands and uh, yes I, I you could absolutely buy the figures in here in North Star figures games while it's still available um, I'm going to wait and create my beautifulest bestest bunch of group of people maybe or I'll just get impatient and find whichever models I can but um I really enjoy this style and I would love to play a campaign out probably cooperative I like the idea of going competitively as well I'm not sure do let me know what you think of this book and uh if you wanted to acquire it well for your ease um I'm not associated with you acquiring the game at all but I am going to put it in the, the description below anyway I hope you enjoyed I hope you can understand me <laughs> and I will catch you in the next video Bye. thank you Osprey Games for giving this to me I have a had a, I've had a wealth of fun looking through it and imagining